a retired uh, he retired from as an employee as uh, in, in the Madison School District, I believe, as a school counselor. Is that correct, John? School psychologist, but close school enough. Psychologist, and is also an avid traveler and natural photographer. And um, tonight he's uh, giving us a very special presentation about. Uh, whether or not at the very best dark sky sites we can see our own shadows as given to us from the light of the Milky Way. So everyone, please let, allow me to present John Rummel. Thanks, Lawrence. So uh, before I get started, um, let, me, let me just, uh, by way of uh, preview of coming attractions, I mentioned earlier that next month, our very own Bob Hamers is going to give a talk on solar photography. And the month after that, in um, October, I'm really looking forward to this one. Uh, a little earlier tonight, Chris, you mentioned the Dark Sky Finder website. Anybody who knows me has heard me talk about the Dark Sky Finder website. Our October meeting is the creator of the Dark Sky Finder website, David Lorenz. And uh, even if we're not virtual, uh, David is a Madison guy, believe it or not. He's an atmospheric scientist uh, for the UW. And uh, in his spare time, he's an amateur astronomer who is very interested in dark skies, interested enough that he created the tool that um, I am an evangelist for and many other people in MAS use to find dark sky sites. So keep those in mind. A word about tonight, um, I'm going to go ahead and ask everybody to self-mute right now. Um, if you have any questions during uh, the first part of my talk, um, I would say don't worry about the chat. Just feel free to unmute yourself and, and add the question in, and I'll, I'll try to deal with it um, in line as much as possible. If it's the kind of question that can wait, though, hold it until the end. About three quarters of the way through my talk, I am going to invite everybody who wants to, to unmute because I'm gonna show you some pictures and we're gonna do some A-B comparison type stuff. And I want your feedback during that. So I'm gonna, at that time, I'm gonna invite everybody who wants to, to unmute and we're gonna see how that goes. But I'm gonna start with my screen sharing right now. So I am going to share the presentation so hopefully right now you see a dark screen with the title. Everybody got it? Sorry, I had you all mute. Yep. Okay. Uh, all right, so Shadow of the Milky Way. Um, this has been a topic that I have been uh, fascinated by for many years. I think ever since I've been an observer, I've heard uh, people anecdotally say, whether it's in person at a star party or online, people will tend to brag about how good their observing site is. And one of the ways they do that is they say, you know, it was so dark that you could see your shadow by the Milky Way. And at first, I just accepted those stories as, you know, just a given that, that these people have clearly observed at some of the darkest places a lot darker than any place that I've ever seen. And I didn't question them. But as I became more experienced in my own observing, um, and as I got a chance to travel some more, I started looking more critically at those claims because the Milky Way is a very faint, very large, very diffuse, very low contrast object. Is it possible that it could really cast shadows? Um, and so um, what I have done for the last 10 years or so is I've gathered up those anecdotes. I've almost collected anecdotes. And of course, I've done a lot of searching online too. Tonight, we're going to move, I hope, from anecdote to experiment. And we're actually going to take a look at some um, rigorous, rigorous attempts to document this. And I uh, will ask all of you for your opinion um, you know, did I do a good job of proving my hypothesis? And I'll share what my hypothesis is in a little bit. So anyway, I'm John Rummel. That's what we're going to do tonight. Um, as I've searched online, um, I've come across, and I've saved a couple of, of my favorite claims. When people claim that they could see their shadow by the Milky Way, 
It's almost always as a um, kind of a throwaway comment. It's never backed up by any kind of evidence. And um, if you ask questions for more information, it's often accompanied by hand waving and um, you know vague claims of you know I saw this or this or this. And I've, I've got some pretty fantastic claims that have been shared with me. But I wanted to share a couple that I found online and in print sources over the past couple of years that I've saved. This is from a website called Lenspire. Lenspire is a photographer's website. And like many photography websites these days, it attracts quite a few astronomers, people who do dark sky photography. This is a guy named Zdenek Bardal, and um, he observes from a location, um, geez, I believe this is from Atacama, South America, uh, high in the Andes. Um, so you can see his name up there. He talks about uh, the photography that he does now, but Atacama Desert, is a prime space. It's probably one of the darkest, highest deserts in the world. This is his comment on heading to the Atacama des Desert. Right. You can read his comment down there, but I'm going to highlight his uh, second to last sentence. It is so clear that the Milky Way even casts a shadow. And I wonder if that's partly a translational thing, if you meant to say it's so dark that the Milky Way casts a shadow. But either way, it works because Atacama is, I think, pushing 12,000 feet above sea level. And it's, again, it's a desert. It's one of the driest places in the world. It's a great observing place. If there's any place that you can see your shadow by the Milky Way, the Atacama Desert would be a good candidate. Um, I corresponded with Zdenek and asked him if he had any uh, you know, follow up to that claim. And, and, and he was one of the many who really didn't, but he just swore that he's been there so many times in other dark places that, you know, you can see it. This is one that comes from uh, closer to us. This comes from Sky and Telescope magazine in the uh, May 2018 issue. So just three years ago, uh, another uh, group of people journeying in the Southern hemisphere. And I believe this was a location in Australia. They say it's really dark here talking about the uh, center of the galaxy lying right on the zenith. And there it is. Uh, the stories that say the Milky Way can cast a shadow are not exaggerated. I corresponded with these guys. And again, they had no evidence other than their memories, their recollections of what a great, great dark place this was, um, someplace in Australia. And finally, another one from Sky and Telescope magazine, this one from just two years ago, July 2019. This was a great article testing whether or not the, um, the accepted wisdom that red lights are the best type of light to use to not uh, affect your own dark sky adaptation or night sky adaptation. And they made a case for orange. But in the, con the context of this discussion, they were a very dark place in Queensland, Australia, and again, they made the claim that it was so dark that the core of the Milky Way overhead often casts a shadow. These three examples are just, um, just three that I picked out of a big, big stack of examples that I have. This claim is made often. And I think once I started paying attention to it, once I started looking for it, it just pops up everywhere. Here's another one from a little closer to home, the Nebraska Star Party just took place last week, um, just closed a few days ago. Um, this was their homepage this year. And of course this was prior to the star party. So registration was still open. But if you scroll down their homepage, there's some more information about the star party. And there at the bottom, Nebraska star party claims the impressive dark skies, the Milky Way casts a shadow. It was so dark, how dark was it? The Milky Way cast a shadow. That claim is all over the place. So starting out with just the definition, what is a shadow? Because this is going to be important. We're gonna talk about definitions a lot and we're gonna talk about nuance in the definition a lot. A shadow is a dark area or shape produced by a body coming between rays of light and a surface. Pretty straightforward defini definition of a shadow. So I want to share a couple of more pictures as uh, by way of example. This is an astronomy picture of the day from 11 years ago, August 23rd, 2010. I still remember when this was the picture of the day because I was fascinated by this topic even back then. 
and uh, actively read their description. This was the APOD editor's title, A Milky Way Shadow at Lock Ard Gorge, credit and copyright Alex Cherney. <clears throat> Lock Ard Gorge is a location along the um, ocean road that leads from Adelaide to um, Melbourne, Australia. It's uh, about a 300 mile long drive right along the, most of it's right along the Southern coast of Australia, the Southern Ocean. It's a very, very dark area. Most of that area is very isolated, Bortle One. So this is a picture of looking out over the Loch Ard Gorge. By the way, those towers in the center used to be an, a, a natural arch. And back in the 1990s, I believe it collapsed. Now it left the Loch Ard Towers. Uh, but anyway, uh, this photographer took a picture and uh, submitted it to Astronomy Picture of the Day and it was accepted and it ran with this title. Um, and what he's referring to, or what the editors are referring to, are those features in front of the towers and those features in front of the cliffs, the shadows of the Milky Way. Here's a little bit of zoom in for some detail of those, those uh, dark areas under the towers, those shadows. Now, some of you may be aware, some of you may not be aware that every single astronomy picture of the day has an accompany, accompanying um, blog post or message board post. And uh, every day when the APOD appears, the first entry is made, it's called Starship Asterisk. And the first entry is posted by the editors and it's basically just the same description of the, um, of the picture. And then you can reply to it. So you just, you know, you log in, you create a membership at the site. I've been a member for many, many years. Sometimes I participate in these discussions because almost every APOD produces a really good uh, message thread about the various issues that it raises. So in this message thread about the Lock Ard Gord picture, many of the commenters pointed out that those really aren't shadows down there. Those are reflections the water is not glassy smooth, but the long exposure of the photograph averages out the motions of the water until it becomes a specular surface. It's a reflective surface. And so what we're seeing there is we're seeing illumination from the Milky Way reflected in the water, but then we're seeing the, the um, essentially the reflection of the dark side, the dark near side of those rocks and the cliffs. And so people, uh, uh, argue that it was not a shadow. Other people replied, well, aren't you just describing a shadow, but you're just using different terminology? Isn't it, isn't it six of one and a half a dozen of the other? And this discussion went on for 20 or 30 messages. And in the end, um, the uh, reflection people uh, with the logic of, of their explanation kind of won the day. And something happened that you don't see happen very often. The editors, the astronomy picture of the day went back and edited their description to indicate that these were not strictly speaking shadows of the Milky Way, that they were more reflections of foreground features uh, being reflected by the water. So I just wanted to throw up a couple of more examples of this effect. One could also say that this picture uh, by the photographer Laren Ray, another Australian, um, shows the shadow of the Milky Way of that mountain in the background and the shadow of the Milky Way uh, of the pier. But I think this one shows even more vividly that these are not shadows, these are simply reflections of foreground features. One of the ways that you can tell the difference between a shadow and a reflection is that if you're looking at a true shadow and you move, your eyes move around it, the shadow stays in the same place. If you're looking at a reflection and you move, the reflection always stays directly between you and the object, its reflection in the specular surface. In this case, the surface of the water will move with you as you move. Here's another example, this one also from Laren Ray, showing uh, the reflection of the rocks in the bay. Um, uh, so again, I would argue and uh, I think most people would agree that those, strictly speaking, are not examples of shadows. Those are examples of reflection, something very, very different. As long as we're talking about shadows, I wanna just digress for a minute and talk about other objects that can cast shadows. 
This is a very recent article from the Sky and Telescope website in April of just last year, shadow casting with Venus, play a shadow game with Venus before the moon returns on April 24th of last year. So this guy basically set up an experiment to show that Venus casts a shadow. So here he's got a couple of objects on a stepladder in front of a white piece of poster board that he has taped to the side of his car. And he did it in this geometry because obviously Venus is gonna be low on the horizon presumably off camera here to the right someplace. And he's going to allow Venus to cast a shadow on that surface. And then he's going to document it with a photograph. Here is his photograph. On the left, the shadow of uh, those objects by Venus, light. And on the right for comparison, same shadows by sunlight. So you can see there that even the planet Venus casts a shadow. And here, same guy, same article, he obviously had a sheet of some sort hanging from something, not sure what this was, but then you can see the shadow of his hands. Um, uh, again, shadow cast by light from Venus. Now, Venus is pretty bright, um, averaging a magnitude minus four, point source of light. Everybody knows how bright Venus is. I don't think anybody is surprised that something like Venus or even the planet Jupiter can cast shadows. Here's his setup again. Here's his description from the article. Find a dark place next clear night and see for yourself. To photograph your shadow, set the ISO to 8,000 and expose wide open full aperture F2.8 or F4 for 20 to 30 seconds. And I'll stop reading there, but this is just to point out, in order to capture the shadow of Venus, you can see it with the naked eye, but in order to capture it photographically, look at the lengths that you have to go to with your camera, boosting the ISO in his case to 8,000 and then exposing full aperture f2.8 for 20 to 30 seconds. For those of you who know photography, that is highly sensitive. Now these shadows are visible to the naked eye. I've seen shadows by Venus light before. Your eye is a tremendous optical instrument, great dynamic range. It's easy to see with your eye if you're dark adapted. It's difficult, but possible, to capture the evidence photographically. This guy showed how to do it. So that question arose with Venus and Jupiter, sure you can. How about this question? Do stars ever cast shadows? This is a Q&A that appeared in the newsletter of a local astronomy club. And so uh, in answer, the astronomy club replied, the bright planets Venus and Jupiter can often be easily observed to cast shadows. However, contrary to the expectations of many, the fixed stars cast shadows with some, and with some precautions, one can observe them. Henry Norris Russell made some investigations in the problem. He darkened a room and admitted starlight through a hole with a square foot aperture and projected the light on the screen. He found 29 stars casting perceptible shadows. The faintest one of these was 15 Argus, magnitude, magnitude 2.9. Now, I have no idea if Henry Norris Russell actually did this experiment. I give the writer the benefit of the doubt. I've certainly never heard of it. And I'm a little skeptical that a magnitude th three star can cast a shadow. But I put it up here because the Astronomical Society that published this was us. This came from the July 1935 issue of the Madison Bulletin published monthly by the Madison Astronomical Society. That's us. This is um, about six months after the formal formation of the club. They had a pretty spiffy newsletter back in those days. So somebody asked the question about stars casting shadows, they answered. Finally, one more picture I wanna show you. It's this one taken by a great photographer named Jia Hao. Um, I don't know much about him. Um, he seems to be primarily uh, doing most of his work from Australia, so I'll assume he lives in Australia. This is a picture that he took um, in a very dark location. I'll let him explain where it was. This is a comment from his uh, blog that he drove his camper van to this location somewhere near Renner Springs in Central Australia. It's really dark there, very remote. But then I'll point out 
that in order to capture the shadow, he could see the shadow by waving his hand over the bonnet of his car. In order to capture it, he boosted the settings of his Canon 5D Mark II, 15 millimeter fisheye lens to the highest possible, I'm assuming highest possible uh, aperture and uh, uh, ISO and managed to capture the shadow. And there it is, if you haven't seen it, you can see him holding his arm up over the hood of his car and you can clearly see, I hope, on your monitor as well as on mine, uh, that he is capturing the shadow of the Milky Way. And uh, by way of explanation, he notes this picture is a deceptively wide field. He stitched together six images. Uh, so the Milky Way was actually directly overhead in this picture. It just doesn't look like it because of the compressed perspective that his wide field uh, imposes upon the photograph. The, the Milky Way was directly overhead, and I think you can all see that he clearly has captured a shadow, a faint, diffuse shadow of his arm over the hood of his car. I think this is a really, really good example of what it takes to capture. The shadow is there, it is visible, but it just takes a bit of doing photographically to document. You really have to boost the settings of your camera. Now, I um, had done a form of this experiment over the years when I was at a dark place. So maybe out west in uh, you know some really isolated uh, national forest ground in Utah or Wyoming or Montana. And I would be talking with some other amateur astronomers and we would be talking about the shadow of the Milky Way. And so I would often do an experiment by holding my hand over a light colored uh, surface. Like, you know, I didn't have a white car, uh, but it could have been a freshly poured uh, slab of concrete on the ground. It could have been the side of somebody's camper, or sometimes I had a white shirt on, so I would do it holding my hand about eight inches over my shirt and showing them that pretty much on any given night that just the brightness of the sky alone, the ambient brightness of the sky, you could see that it was darker under my hand than it was if I took my hand away. Same thing if you have a car parked, look underneath the car. It's gonna be darker under the car than it is not under the car because the sky itself casts light. And so my hypothesis became over the years that what people were claiming as the shadow of the Milky Way was really the shadow of the sky itself, because if Gia would have moved his arm about two or three feet above the hood of the car, that shadow would effectively vanish. Because if, as I'm hypothesizing, the light source is not just the Milky Way, but the whole sky, that shadow would quickly diffuse out into nothing. So going back to one of my own pictures, I started with this picture back at the beginning. I took this picture from a very dark area in Montana about uh, uh, four years ago. In fact, it was after the eclipse of the sun. I was on my way home and I stopped at this location in Montana. We're gonna zoom in on that tree because I went back after the fact and looked at this picture. Look under that tree. You know, that looks kind of like a shadow under that tree um, and not a picture that I was taking for that reason. Shadows of the Milky Way, shadows of the night sky, it's possible. So I want to stick my pin in the ground, stick my, my stake in the ground. This is my hypothesis. My hypothesis is and was for many years, the Milky Way can cast a shadow, but so can the night sky without the Milky Way. In essence, that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying the Milky Way can't cast a shadow, but I'm saying that the sky itself, even without the Milky Way, could cast a shadow. So the Milky Way may contribute to the effect, but even if you take the Milky Way away, the night sky can cast a shadow. As a corollary to that, the night sky emits light. Sky glow combined with starlight and the natural background glow of the universe is sufficient to create a shadow effect. This is part of my hypothesis. Finally, my conclusion is that this shadow is indistinguishable from what witnesses describe as the Milky Way shadow. So if that is true, and we'll come back to those statements of hypotheses. If that's true, Jia Hao didn't go far enough 
because to complete the experiment, what he could have done is he could have replicated this picture maybe the same night, maybe a different night, a couple of months before or after when it was dark, when it was cloudless, when there was no moon, and also when there was no Milky Way in the sky. We have springtime, you know, when we can, it's galaxy season, when the Milky Way hasn't risen yet, and we're looking in the direction of Virgo and, uh, and, and you know, the constellations known for their galaxies. In Australia, that month is October, when you can get the sky virtually without the Milky Way. So he could have replicated this photo on a night when it was equally as dark, used the same camera settings, same conditions without the Milky Way overhead. And I wonder what he would have seen under his arm on the hood of his car. So Gia didn't do it. I tried. Here was my method. So this is the, the, the gist of my presentation. Under very specific conditions, and I'll, I'll talk in a minute about what those conditions were, attempt to photograph the shadow circumstances with no Milky Way in the sky. Okay, everybody understand? I'm going to use a dark sky spread with stars, but without the Milky Way above. An attempt to photograph the shadow against a light surface. Step two, attempt to replicate number one as closely as possible with the Milky Way in the sky. So if I can do these two things, I will have a true A, B comparison. A dark sky with no Milky Way, look at the kind of shadow that it may cast, and a dark sky with the Milky Way, trying to look at the shadow that it casts. Step three, take care that all photos are taken with identical camera settings and identical post-processing steps, making sure that everything is done rigorously the same in steps one and two. And then finally, step four, compare the Milky Way and the non-Milky Way photos. Pretty simple, uh, pretty simple steps, right? So I had this in my mind for years. I finally got the opportunity to do it at the Cosmic Campground in New Mexico, the Gila National Forest. Cosmic Campground is so far as I know, yet the only IDA sanctuary approved site that is part of the federal government. It is a national forest campsite. And it's a pretty good one. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, it's located here. Maps of Arizona and New Mexico, the red dot indicates the location. It is approximately equidistant between the three major population areas that are relatively close by, but it's 170 to 180 miles away from the nearest large city, which is Phoenix, and then Albuquerque and El Paso. Just to give you an idea of another landmark that some of you may know, the very large array is located right at that intersection uh, between Socorro and, and the western part of the state. Um, here it is on the dark sky finder. The campsite is at the red dot. So you can see Phoenix, Albuquerque, and El Paso. And there's some smaller towns scattered around the perimeter. They're a little bit closer, but even a town like um, Silver, Silverton, I believe Silverton, is only 9,000 people and it's over 60 miles away. This is a very, very dark place. The dark gray in the center here is Bortle Class 1. So it was right on the edge of Bortle Class 1. The very large array right up there is kind of right on the northeastern edge of that. Um, this is the dark sky finder using 2006 data. Here's 2016 data for comparison. Watch the Bortle one area from 2006 to 2016. And you can see that the, the Bortle one area is shrinking as you would expect as those uh, major urban areas continue to grow. But the Cosmic Campground is still smack dab in the middle of Bordeaux Class 2. It's a really good site. It's really dark there. This is a picture taken from my campsite there. 
I visited in May. It was my second trip to the Cosmic Campground. So you can see just a dusk uh, looking at the mountains. This is looking toward the um, south. Um, it's a beautiful sight. Um, I'm going to swing the camera now around. And this is the setup for my experimental procedures. So I've got a camera on a tripod aimed at my car. And on the side of my car, I have draped a sheet. My car is parked uh, at an angle in the driveway or the, 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 the uh, gravel area of my campsite. My car is directly perpendicular to the southeast because the southeast is where the Milky Way will be after it rises after midnight. So that is my setup. That camera will not move. My car won't move. The sheet won't move. Everything will be exactly in the same place because I'm going to do a set of photographs after dark, before the Milky Way rises. And I'm going to then do the same set of photographs a few hours later after the Milky Way is up. Now, switching to the view from my camera here, again, looking at my car with the sheet hanging off the side. So that's the surface upon which the shadow will be cast. What am I going to use to cast the shadow? I thought a lot about this, uh, hands, certain objects. I eventually decided to be, to be very simple about it and I'm going to use my body. So what I'm going to do is I am going to stand approximately one foot in front of that sheet. Now the sheet is angled a little bit, so it's closer to my legs than it is to my shoulders because the car, you know, kind of has a little bit of a lean there with the windows. So I'd say my legs are about, you know, 12 inches in front of that sheet. Up at the windows, it's probably more like 18 inches or so. But my body is going to be the gnomon or the shadow caster. Now I want you to take a look at something here. This is again the sheet without me and the sheet with me. So I just blink those a couple of times. Now look at the sheet behind me as I blink those on and off. Keep in mind the sun is over here in the west setting. The sun is still up because you can see it shining on the, the outhouse and you can see it shining on the trees. It's even shining a little bit on my wheel down there. But look at the illumination of the sheet behind me. When I'm not standing in front of it, the sheet is a little bit lighter. When I'm standing in front of it, even though there's no discrete light source in front of me, the entire sky to my southeast is emitting light because it's still, you know, there's blue light being scattered in the sky. It's a little bit darker behind me. That is kind of the effect that we'll be looking for because in a few minutes, I'm going to show you the nighttime photographs and I'm going to blink the shot of the sheet with no me and then the shot of me standing in front of it. And we're going to take a look at what kind of shadow effect there is behind it. The other thing that I did is I had a 10 by 10 inch piece of cardboard that I attempted to hold at a distance of 10 inches in front of the sheet. So that's the second experiment that I did. My body and a 10 inch piece of cardboard held about 10 inches in front of the sheet like that. Now, it's not perfect and I'll warn you ahead of time that I'm, I'm estimating these distances, but I did the best I could. I did one more set of experiments. Besides me standing one foot in front of the sheet, I also took a step forward and I shot a series of photos of me standing about three feet in front of the sheet. I don't have a daytime version of that, so you'll just have to trust me on that. I'll show it to you in the dark. But there is my experimental setup. And here are the exact circumstances. <clears throat> this was the night of May 7th to 8th just a couple of months ago, 2021. The location was the Cosmic Campground near Reserve, New Mexico. There are the coordinates, the elevation. Solid, bordel two skies. The camera was a Canon EOS 80D with a Tamron 28-75 to zoom lens, 
set to 50 millimeters, ISO 3200 F2.8, and the exposures were all 20 seconds. So those uh, exposure details did not change. All of the nighttime shots were shot with those exact settings. And then when I pulled the pictures into Photoshop, <clears throat> I did have to do some enhancement and I'll show you why, but all of the photos that I'm gonna show you were edited exactly the same using this set of settings, Photoshop curves, uh, specifically to increase contrast to make the sheet and any shadow effects visible. And that exact same Photoshop adjustment was applied equally to every single image. And again, I'll show you a little bit about how I did that. So that was the circumstances of the photography. The two shots were as follows. The pre-Milky Way shot before the Milky Way rose, 10.26 p.m. local time. Just to give you an idea of where the center of the Milky Way was, Deneb in the constellation Cygnus was barely above the horizon. Cygnus was hugging the horizon, not even up yet. So you know that the summer Milky Way had not risen yet. And the sun was 26 degrees below the horizon. So it was full astronomical dark. The post Milky Way or the Milky Way shot was taken approximately three hours later at about 1.35 a.m. on the morning of May 8th. Deneb was now at an altitude of about 28 degrees. So Cygnus was well up. Uh, likewise, the Milky Way's core sort, uh, um, Scorpius and Sagittarius were well above the horizon, and uh, the sun was at that time 39 degrees below the horizon, so it was nice and dark. At the time of both shots, the ambient light conditions in the campground were ideal. Everybody was asleep. Um, no artificial lights within my view. Uh, no artificial lights anywhere. So it was dark. This is just a quick simulation with, uh, I think I used, um, uh, I used a planetarium program, approximately 10.30 p.m. Uh, that is Vega. Deneb is not even visible yet. So the Milky Way is basically laying on the horizon. The Milky Way is not above the horizon yet. And about 1.30 a.m., you can see that the Milky Way is up. And because this isn't the greatest simulation, I also took a picture about that time, about 1.30 in the morning. This is what the Milky Way looked like in a three minute exposure. And during that exposure, somebody did get up to use the bathroom. And that's what the red light is over here. Uh, and you can see that somebody also shined a red light in that car. It might've even been a dashboard light, I'm not sure. But anyway, it was really dark. The Milky Way was well up and beautifully placed. So those are the circumstances. So this is the part now where I'm going to invite your feedback. I am going to stop screen sharing. I'm going to switch to Photoshop. So <clears throat> you should all be seeing now on your screens, my Photoshop window. So up here, I've got two pictures loaded, they're in tabs. One of them is called the pre-Milky Way stack and one of them is called the Milky Way stack. So what we're looking at here is the pre-Milky Way stack. This is the initial shot but, uh, without me standing in the way. It's 1036 at night, the Milky Way is not up. You can see the stars in the background and you can see that the sheet is very grainy looking because at ISO 3200, um, with this curves adjustment, I've really boosted um, the levels here. And so you're getting quite a bit of noise. By the way, this is what it looks like without the Photoshop adjustment. I don't know how this comes through on your monitor. I can still see the stars in the sky. I can still see the silhouette of the drain. And I, and I can still barely see the sheet. But I, I can't see it very well. So this is with the Photoshop adjustment. So everybody got what we're looking at? Everybody? Yep. Cool? So first comparison shot, I step into frame and I shoot another 20 second exposure with me standing in front of the sheet. Here it is. Yep. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna blink it on and off several times. And I'm gonna go slow 
and I'm going to I'm going to narrate it as I'm doing it so everybody knows what we're looking at. 10:30 at night, the Milky Way is not up. Look at the sheet behind me. So here's with me standing in front, and here it is without me. With without with is there a shadow effect looks like it without yeah looks like it to me too so for comparison's sake now remember i told you i was going to take one step forward so instead of being one foot away from the sheet i'm going to step forward to three feet here's that shot so you can still just see me at the edge of the frame is there a shadow effect? Let's take a look. I'm going to blink it on and off with the original. Without me, with me at three feet. Without me, with me. Still a little something there. It gets darker. There's no, there's no mistake that it gets darker, but it's so diffuse now that it's difficult to see any discrete shadow. It yeah. just kind of looks like the entire sheet is a little bit darker. Here yeah. it is again, without me and with me at three feet. Yeah. By comparison, here it is again with me at one foot compared to three feet. One foot, the shadow has a little bit of definition. It's still very diffuse, very diffuse, but it has a little bit of definition, three feet, pretty much loses all definition. Everybody still with me? Yep. Yep. All right, keep in mind, 1030 at night, no Milky Way in the sky. This is just a nighttime, beautiful sky from a Bortle II location. I'm gonna take both of those off. And here I am with the cardboard square, 10 inches on each side. Without, with. Without, with. Shadow effect, clearly it's darker in the immediate vicinity of the shadow, or I'm sorry, in the immediate vicinity of the card than it is elsewhere, but you can still see that there is a little bit of very subtle effect in the broader areas of the sheet, probably caused by the fact that my body is in proximity there. So I'm blocking some of the sky. Without the card, with the card. Without the card, with the card. So keep in mind, the first part of my hypothesis was that the sky itself, without the Milky Way present, the sky itself, is capable of casting shadows. But let me remind you again, that this is with a lot of Photoshop enhancement. This is what it looked like without the Photoshop enhancement. 20 second exposure, boosted ISO, <laughs> lens wide open. <clears throat> and no, I note that you can also see the shadows cast by the wrinkles in the fabric. Exactly, exactly. And again, keep in mind that those shadows, the contours, because the sheet is not laying perfectly flat, catching light from every location in the sky, basically 360 degrees left, right, back, forth, and straight overhead. Where is the apparent shadow of the folds in the sheet? It's on the underside toward the ground. Uh, you know, take that for what it's worth. In the interior of this little crevice here, looks a little bit darker there. Interesting observation, Lawrence, good point. Okay, but that's only half the story because remember, this was the pre-Milky Way, 10.36 p.m. The Milky Way has not risen yet. Everything is the same. Everything stays in place. We just wait three hours. Three hours later, this is what it looks like. 1.30 a.m., oh, 1.34, 1.35, I forget the exact time. The Milky Way is now blazing beautifully um, about halfway up the southeast sky. The, the sheet is angled directly toward that. Let's just blink back and forth to the 10.30 versus the 
I'm not standing in front of it. This is just light from the sky. No Milky Way. Milky Way. Yeah. No Milky Way. Milky Way. See a difference? Oh, yeah. Well, Milky Way clearly is adding additional light in. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly, the Milky Way does not subtract light. If it does anything, the Milky Way adds light. Shouldn't be that surprising. Okay, let's take a look at the set of three photos. I'm gonna step in front, again, one foot away, and I'm gonna take a picture with me standing in front of the sheet with the Milky Way in the sky. Without, wow. with, without, and with. Now, just to be thorough, let's go back to the pre-Milky Way shot with me standing in front. 10.30 p.m., one foot away from the sheet. 1.30 a.m., one foot away from the sheet. 10.30, pretty diffuse, but a shadow nonetheless. 1.30 a.m., what do you think? Looks like the shadow is better defined because you have a- It looks a like course. a little bit better definition of the shadow when I agree with you. It definitely looks like the shadow quality, the shadow definition is improved from the pre-Milky Way to the Milky Way shot. Anybody want to see it again? It's, One interesting, more time. That you, it's interesting that you lost the shadow up on uh, around your shoulders. Uh, interesting. Well, let's, let's just blink it on and off. Still there. It's just more diffuse because, again, my shoulders are probably at least six to ten inches further away from the yeah, sheet. No, no. I, I'm talking about the about the blink comparison between the two pictures. I think in the in the earlier shot there was more of a shadow up around your shoulders, and in this one there's less of a shadow there. So this is blinking the uh, pre Milky Way. Right. with and without me, and this is blinking the Milky Way with and without me. Well, it could make sense from the standpoint that it's um, the, the, the most intense light source is coming from the horizon. Yeah, or just above the horizon. Just, above, just the horizon. above the horizon, I mean, yeah. yes. Which, yeah. which uh, in the upper part of the sheet, which is angled more toward the, uh, more toward Zenith, uh, that's more your ambient um, uh, skylight. Could be, could be. Just to John, complete the sequence. Oh, go ahead, somebody else. John, it looks like I'm perceiving a color shift that the starlight seems a little more orange and the Milky Way shadow is more gray. You mean in the sky, Carol? No, on the sheet. Oh, so the, the, the color of light on the sheet, before, you know, blink off, blink on? Like that, but go go back to the um, ambient light shadow, the starlight shadow versus Milky Way shadow. So this is starlight with with without me in front of it. Just, this is pre Milky Way. This is Milky Way. So I'm seeing a slight color shift in the sky as well as a little bit of a color shift on the sheet. I'm seeing some artifacts. Can you see those? Uh, those chromatic artifacts in the picture. Yes. I, I don't know what, other than the fact that it's just boosting, you know, boosting the settings a little bit too much. I don't see it as much there, maybe because there's just more natural illumination, but then blinking me on and off, the colors behind, the colors of the sheet seem to get more muted. Is that what you're referring to? The sheet seems a little bit more colorful here. Then when my body is shading it, it kind of loses color and gets washed out. Well, your shadow seems more gray on yeah. the Milky Way one, and your shadow seems still a little bit more orange on the starlight shadow one. Which is probably the diffusion. Could be, yeah. Interesting, interesting comments, though. That's good. One, so, other, so one, other, thought, one other thought on that is in the earlier uh, pictures without the Milky Way, um, I would presume might be earlier in the evening when the temperature was different than later in the evening. 
in these CMOS, since you don't have any temperature control on the CMOS, um, there might have been different temperature readings and different temperature artifacts like that artifact you were pointing out. Yeah, that's that's a fair comment. Uh, I don't, I didn't, I didn't take note of the ambient temperatures, but you notice that I've got a fleece on here where I was in a t-shirt in the previous shot. Uh, oh no, well, no, I wasn't. Oh yeah, yeah. I well, yeah. Before sunset, I had a t-shirt on. After sunset, I did put the fleece on. Temperature probably drops, you know, ten degrees, maybe fifteen degrees, but it was still a very mild night. I was perfectly comfortable with just the fleece. I would guess the temperature dropped from the high 60s to the high 50s. Would that affect the behavior of the CMOS sensor? Yeah, I bet it would. And Lawrence, I bet you're right. That probably does figure into some of the effect that we're seeing. Yeah, and that would just, that might just redden, redden the overall picture a little bit. I've at least noticed that when I do dark frames early in the night versus later in the night and when the, the sensor temperatures. Because my CMOS camera, when I use Backyard EOS, it records the sensor temperature with every subframe. Cool. One so other, just a complete- One other observation, John. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, the, uh, w when you were looking at the, the two uh, pre-Milky Way and post-Milky Way with, with, without you standing in front of it, uh, someone pointed out before the shadows on the pre-Milky Way seem to be, um, uh, it seems like the light source is more coming from above. And when you go uh, Milky Way up, the light source seems to be coming uh, more straight on. And it's filled some of the shadows, the draped. On the draped shadows. That's a good point. Yeah, I agree with you. If you look at the contours and the textures of the sheet, Milky Way, no Milky Way. Right. Milky Way, no Milky Way. So again, that would that would again argue against my hypothesis that uh, the shadow is essentially indistinguishable because I think we're picking up some distinguishing characteristics. So here again, this is me one foot with the Milky Way up and I'm stepping forward to two feet. One foot, two feet, you can see the shadow gets much more diffuse, but is it still there? So this is compared with the original, without me at all, just the Milky Way shining, me standing three feet away. Just yeah. the Milky Way, me standing three feet away. The sheet is still darkened, but now there's much less definition, much more diffuse. Go but ahead. if you look at this as the juncture where the car starts to curve, shadow is definitely better down here than it is up here. John, Jürgen, I think that was you, Jürgen, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious. I believe at this point, the Milky Way is actually horizontal in the sky pretty much, according to that earlier picture you had, is that correct? Horizontal, I would say it's not horizontal. I would, I would say that it's, yeah, it's like a, it's a gentle angle, but you know, the Sagittarius Scorpius region in the South would be much closer to the horizon. Sorry about my dog. Cygnus is now about uh, you know 30 degrees or so above the horizon. So it's a gently sloping Milky Way, but the brightest think, portion of the Milky Way is lower. But, but the, the point I'm making is I think the light source you have now is actually more diffuse across horizontally across the sky than in the earlier picture. The, the Milky Way certainly is brighter, but it's also more diffuse uh, horizontally in the sky which could account also for some of the changes in, in the definition of the shadow. Could be, could be. So let's do the final test. Let's get me out of there. And I'm gonna step back in now with the cardboard 10 inch rectangle. Huh. Without, with. This is with the Milky Way up. Without, with. Definite shadow of the card. Definitely yeah. the shadow can be seen very well concentrated in the area just under the card. To be thorough, let's go back to the pre-Milky Way image, put the card in there, and now you'll see how bad my alignment was. No Milky Way, Milky Way. 
No Milky Way? Milky Way. John? Yeah. Ed Proctor here. I'm wondering if the uh, overall light from the Milky Way is so diffuse and so broad, if you build a frame so that you only had the light coming directly from the Milky Way, would you be able to see a more defined shadow in it rather that would, than light co coming from that, all over the place? That would be a natural extension of this experiment, building some kind of, a, some kind of an aperture through which to let the light of the Milky Way shine and mask off the rest of the sky. Absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, one more time, my cardboard square without the Milky Way. You can definitely see the darkening behind the square, cardboard square with the Milky Way. And again, just to remind you what it would look like without Photoshop enhancement. Can you see a shadow? Well, <coughs> not without enhancement. To the naked eye, because your eye, my eye, is so good with wide dynamic range, can you see this when you're standing there holding the card right next to it? Yes, you can. Can you see it without the Milky Way? Yes, you can. My hypothesis was the two would be so close, they would virtually be indistinguishable. Was I right? Nope. With, without the Milky Way, with the Milky Way. Okay. I don't think you can tell from photographs. Uh, you're talking about the dynamics of the eye coming into yeah. the play. And uh, as you say, it compensates a whole lot. So it's, it's really hard to say. It's really hard to say because um, without, you know, without all of us gathering together in a really dark place on a really dark night and doing this experiment with just our eyes, photographically is the only other way to really try to do this. So I'm going to stop my screen sharing and I'm going to go back to my presentation. And let's look at some conclusions now. So here are the card shots with and without no Milky Way on the left, Milky Way on the right. And again, you can clearly see that on the right, you have a significantly or at least noticeably better defined shadow than you do in the pre-Milky Way shot. So let me throw up for a moment Gia's hand over the hood of his car. That's approximately what we're seeing in his shot. So I would like I, to, to make a comment on that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, you talk about the difference between reflection and shadow. Well, you've got a car there. It's uh, a nice car. It's uh, obviously um, been waxed and has a reflective surface to it. So in fact, if you go back and look at your shots, it's clear during the daytime when you, when you took your, your, your shots of your, your vehicle during the day. You can actually see all the surrounding uh, hills and so forth reflected in your car. It's actually a little easier because it's a dark uh, colored car. But, uh, you know, looking at this, I don't know whether you can really necessarily distinguish that as a shadow or whether it might just simply be a reflection. In so, Gia's shot? In this shot, Win, or in my shots? In his, this shot here. Okay. Um, so let me, let me respond to that because that's a good point. But I would point out this effect right here, the top of his uh, windshield. What we are seeing is a reflection of the underside of whatever this modification is on his car. That's clearly a reflection. I would still argue that that is a shadow. Because if you were to change the position of the camera or the observer in this shot, as you move around, the position of the reflection would move as your eye moves shadow would stay stationary. If, if there had been an additional shot, we would have yep. been able to distinguish it. Yep, because I can't, I can't prove that because I don't have the evidence. That, that's my hypothesis. That's another extension of this type of work is to really dig deep into the difference between a reflection and a shadow. There, there's also the point, and, and I think this is important to remember, 
uh, when you're looking at surfaces, it's almost never one or the other. Um, most surfaces, even sometimes fairly rough ones, have a specular component to them. So um, you can say it might primarily be a shadow. And I think the shots that you took were primarily shadows. Um, but uh, uh, it, it's always going to be some combination. Yeah, and I agree with I agree with when I think uh, the, uh, the the car is definitely far more reflective than the sheet that John used in his tests. So I think the, uh, the, the the car test is is perhaps not definitive because of the reflectivity of the hood of the of the Mercedes. But I think the reflectivity of the of the sheet is so much lower that uh, John's tests are a far more uh, valid uh, reflection free uh, examination of the the effect. But one I point completely seeing the the car photo is he really didn't even need to put his hand up because if you look at whatever is whatever that is that says Brits on the top of the cap of that vehicle is the casting a shadow downward. Um, similar to what his hand is. And so you, I, I would argue that that's a reflection. That this, it's reflecting off the glass. No, I... I I'm I looking at the, the... Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Right under, not in the car under, but directly under the car topper, it is dark. Right and here. I think that is shadow and not a reflection. So here is the shadow. Here is the reflection. And can't here see might be a combination of both. You can't see my cursor? No, you can't see no. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Crap. Oops. So yeah, just right under the modification, right under the lip of the modification of his cap. Yeah, right. But is the, is the, darker. Is the hood that he's got there, is that sloping? Uh, John, I think you're sharing That would make a screen. difference in terms of whether it was a reflection or not. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go forward now. I'm gonna wrap this up uh, back to my hypothesis statements. The first part of my hypothesis was the Milky Way can cast a shadow, but so can the night sky without the Milky Way. Did I demonstrate that that is true? I think I did. The second part: the night sky emits light, sky glow combined with starlight, natural background glow of the universe is sufficient to create a shadow effect. Did I demonstrate that? I think I did. This shadow is indistinguishable from what witnesses describe as the Milky Way shadow. Did I demonstrate that? I'll give myself a question mark there because I think that the evidence that I showed you shows that there is a quantitative, qualitative difference in the shadow without the Milky Way compared to with the Milky Way. Yeah, I would think that you actually showed the exact opposite, that there is a, a distinguishable yeah. difference. So I, I basically, uh, I provided evidence that my hypothesis is not true. And I have to, uh, you know, I have to reserve judgment against the gathering of further evidence, which I hope to participate in. But for tonight's purposes, for conclusions, I'd have to say there is a difference. There is a difference. I, will, I would agree with you that instrumentally, there's clearly a difference. The question is in terms of human perception, perceptually. Yeah, and when to that point, I would argue that I've done that experiment with a bunch of people over the years from really dark locations by holding my hand over the concrete or over my shirt or next to the camper. And I've, I've definitely shown people that the appearance of darkness underneath the hand or underneath the object is there, regardless of whether the Milky Way is there or not. The oh, I, I agree with you entirely. I'm not, that's not what I'm questioning. I'm questioning, you know, you know whether the, the difference with the Milky Way added in or with it not there is, is perceptually different to people. Exactly. And the problem with demonstrating that without photographs is you can't do a side by side because you have to, on a spring night, you have to at least wait several hours for the right. before and after, which right. is tough. And of yeah. course, the, your, your eyes are dark adapting and changing yep. uh, potentially to that. 
uh, those those kinds of sensory experiments where you're working at the edge are always difficult and uh, you can get variation from observer to observer as well good so, point uh, it, it's just a very difficult thing to do but i i give you a lot of credit for uh, the design of your experiments and, <laughs> thank you uh, the, uh, the, the the whole topic is extremely interesting John, Any, was there somebody else go ahead yeah John. John. it's carol it, is this so subtle that this this experiment would only work in a location such as that portal one or two is there any chance this could be demonstrated here i i think it's a valid question i've only done it from dark locations because um of my my in, in, in inherent bias toward dark locations um, if you're going to try to see something as subtle as this shadow, which is barely there, you're going to need the darkest conditions possible. Would it be possible to do it from your backyard at Bortle four or five? I think it's a great question, and I'd like to see, I'd like to see it tried. Yeah, you could yeah. use that if you compared the results from a Bortle four or five site to a Bortle one or two. You could even get kind of an idea of how much intensity the the milky way light actually is yeah you know, the loss of contrast as the ambient sky pollution light pollution gets brighter and brighter right John, so go, go ahead you're gonna go ahead yeah i'm i mean there's a way you could actually measure this if you had the right instrumentation and that's you're looking really at the integrated sky brightness and if you combine this with Ed's suggestion earlier of doing some sort of a rectangular box to give you a funky pinhole camera, you could actually measure the, the integrated light that you see underneath it and figure out whether or not it's sufficiently different that you would get actually a different shadow. So I, I think it, empirically you could actually figure this one out. Uh, the, the way you design this experiment is fascinating, but I think if you wanted an absolute answer, you could do it that way. And if you looked at a Bortle four or five site, as Lawrence was talking about, I bet you'd get a similar answer, except the numbers would be much smaller and much closer together. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, measuring the, the integrated brightness of the sky, I think is one part of, of the extension. That's still, because, because you are measuring the integrated brightness of an extended patch of sky, the question of the quality or the quantity of shadow that it casts is still a separate question from the brightness. So you well, can you're document. Talking, you're talking then about the the about how the eyeball responds to light, and so that is actually a different question. But in terms of casting a shadow, you know, does the definition of casting a shadow does it have an eyeball in the definition? True. So. Yeah. I would say, does it have an observer? And the observer can be an eyeball or a camera. That's right, uh, that's right. <clears throat> Anybody else before we go on? Well, I was just gonna say that I think there's a there's a instrument that can measure the light intensity and you can, you could, I'm guessing that you could focus on it on a specific part of the um, tarp and, and just look at that you know, measure that intensity on that one spot through all of these, um, you know, changes. So there are light meters that do exactly that, but I don't, I don't know how well calibrated light meters are for the levels of light that we're talking about. Because remember, it's really, really dark, and you're talking about the subtle difference between the darkness with the sky blocked versus the darkness with the sky unblocked. Is it possible to do it? Oh yeah, there's definitely an instrument out there. And I bet Bob Hamers probably has some ideas about this too, because Bob and I have talked about instrumentation like this. There are clearly better ways to do this experiment in almost every facet of what I just did. There are ways to improve upon this, absolutely. So let me go through my caveats. I, I put three caveats. First of all, this is only one experiment from a single location. Can it be improved? Absolutely. My second caveat is the Northern Hemisphere Milky Way is quote unquote second rate. And I say that 
Because if you talk to people who have been to the Southern Hemisphere and observe from the Southern Hemisphere, they will say, and I'm sure they will say to me, oh, you think you could see your shadow from the Milky Way from New Mexico? You know, way do you, way do you observe from my location in Chile? Or way do you observe from my location in Central Australia or whatever? The, the Milky Way down there rides high overhead uh, at night. And we know that things not attenuated by the atmosphere at the horizon are going to shine brighter than things that are attenuated at the horizon. So doing this experiment from the Northern Hemisphere is a ding. Third quibble, as you guys just adequately demonstrated with your comments, every single aspect of what I just did is suspect. Every single aspect of what I just did could be hugely, hugely improved and should be improved. I'm gonna do some of it. Um, and I got some great ideas from you guys tonight. And maybe some of you will bring something to the show too. But I think that I did a pretty good job of disproving my major hypothesis of the last several years. There is a difference. That difference may not be distinguishable to the naked eye, but the difference sure was distinguishable with photographic evidence like this. So that's it, guys. I'm going to stop done, John. Thank oh. you. Yeah, thank you. That was very interesting. Hey, Dan Heislop is here. Good to see you, Dan. Hey, I just wanted to check in from uh, beautiful paradise. I yeah. just caught the last 10 minutes or so of your uh, wonderful talk, John. I wish I could have heard the rest. It's recorded, Dan. I'll Where are you, here. Dan? It looks gorgeous there. And it's still Dan Rainier. Am, uh, uh, Mount Rainier. How about that? Oh, wow. Awesome. Oh, is it hot? What, yeah, what's the temperature? It's, oh, maybe 80 or 85 here at about uh, 5,500 feet. We went up to 10,000 feet, uh, and it was probably about 60. Did you bring any Rainier beer with you? Pond, since you, since you chose yourself to be the gnomon, the two conditions are gnomon and no man. <laughs> good, good one, Neil. That's true. Pretty good pun. I'm going to 